Good morning, afternoon, evening, night, whatever time you're listening to my wonderful voice, music appreciation students. Um, this is Mr. Kimball here for uh, a, one of our first lectures of the new semester, uh, Streams and Themes of American Popular Music. So uh, as you can tell by the title there, we're going to be exploring uh, a little bit of music history, but uh, uh, not necessarily through the the... Bach, Beethoven, Mozart, uh, old white European guys, but more so from the the history of American popular music. So hopefully the music that you guys are listening to a bit, and uh, you know the music that sort of led up to that. So in thinking about American popular music, it's necessary to define what is popular music, and a lot of times we get this confused. Popular music and pop music are two very different things. Pop music more so refers to a, a specific kind of popular music. Uh, pop music is, a, we think of like Britney Spears or, or Michael Jackson, the king of pop. Um, but popular music is more so relating to uh, just types of music that are, are mass produced, uh, types of music that are created by the music industry. So American popular music would be uh, popular music that's created by the American music industry or, or uh, uh, commercialized by the American music industry. So um, when we think of popular music, we really have to compare it to two other kinds of music. Uh, one is called art, or is, as you may know it, classical music. So art music or classical music. That would be what we consider to be like fine arts or, or really high-end music. We, we would think like uh, something you might go in and sit down and listen to at, a, uh, at an orchestra concert or something like that. And then we have folk music. And that would be the music that's not necessarily always commercialized, but it's something that you can kind of hear family play. A lot of that's very religiously influenced. So the first theme that we'll kind of be approaching for the rest of this, this upcoming semester is uh, listening. And, and the point that I want to make to you right off the bat is that you know way more about music than you think you do. Even if you haven't ever played an instrument before, if you've never been in a band or been in choir, you know more about music than you think you do. And let me give you the example here uh, as to why. You want to know why running on the treadmill seven days a week doesn't work for you when you're trying to lose weight? Sorry, you got an ad here. Because it never... Can you see Early light, what so proudly wave at the twilight's last gleaming, whose bright stripes and bright stars through the paralyzed. Okay, so about 60 seconds into that, we can tell that it's very bad. Um, and, and, you know, we don't really need uh, a music education or a formal music school training or uh, $50,000 in student loans from a music school to tell us that that was uh, not so great. And if you like Fergie, um, you know, join the club. I, I also love Fergie and the Black Eyed Peas and all that. But nonetheless, that was a pretty bad rendition of the National Anthem. Uh, it's pretty universally agreed upon that that wasn't good. Uh, and that's just an example of you knowing more about music than you think. You can tell when chords are wrong. You can tell when singers are a little bit off key. You can tell when things just aren't quite lining up or, or sounding right because you've developed a musical ear, particularly for the National Anthem, after listening to it hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of times. So, uh, theme one, listening, you know more about music than you think you do. The second part is about a bit about formal analysis, which is going to be listening for musical structure. We've talked about this in our Scooby-Doo analogy there, but we're going to continue listening for how music is put together, particularly our popular music. It can tell us a lot about uh, how music is kind of uh, 
progressed over a, a large period of time. For example, we can discover that uh, recordings like uh, Glenn Miller's In the Mood, uh, Little Richard's uh, Rock and Roll Anthem Tutti Fruity, and James Brown's I Got You, uh, which you might know as I Feel Good, all have the uh, same basic musical structure, or and add in, you know, the 1960s TV show, the the Batman theme, the no 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 that one. Uh, we have the 12 bar blues form. So all of those use the same general structure of music. Uh, similarly, we can take things like uh, I Got Rhythm by George Gershwin, uh, Yesterday by the Beatles, the Flintstones theme, and we can recognize that all of these have an A-A-B-A -A -A structure. Uh, that's not a rhyme scheme, but a melodic structure. It's like a form. Uh, so all of those vastly different pieces uh, have the same you know, structure of music. But what's really important to remember is formal analysis isn't the only thing that gets us to a musical production. We also have to know about the process analysis. And the process analysis is, a, is really how the music is brought to life. So think about it like, in a little bit of scientific terms here, the, the formal analysis tells us all of the, all of the parts that uh, structure an organism. So it tells us every little portion of an organism but the process analysis tells how of, how all of those parts and structures fit together to make something that we we perceive enjoyable or not enjoyable or, or what have you but the process tells us how it comes to life so important words to know here for listening are hook riff groove timbre lyrics and dialects and i'll kind of go over those briefly here the hook would be a memorable musical phrase or riff. Um, if you remember back to the song Hook by uh, Blues Traveler, they kind of make fun of the hook in, in the chorus of that song. So hook is a memorable musical phrase. Uh, a, a riff is just another word for hook. So those two are kind of interchangeable. They're a repeated pattern. A riff is a repeated pattern to generate rhythmic momentum, but riffs and hooks can be the same thing. A groove is a term that evokes the channeled flow of swinging, funky, or fat with PH, not F, but fat, P-H-A-T rhythms. So groove is kind of like the general flow of a song. And then a timbre is the quality of a sound, uh, which is sometimes what we refer to as a tone color. A timbre is how we can tell whenever someone's playing a clarinet versus when someone's playing a trumpet, even if they're playing the same note. They have a very different tone color. They have a different, very different timbre, which is how we refer to that. Then finally, lyrics is, is the one thing that I hope we all have really grown to know, at least through our song share presentation. Lyrics are the words of a song. And dialect is sometimes misused here, but dialect is a really crucial factor, particularly when we consider the history of American popular music. Dialect is uh, the the language, I guess, that that would be associated with particular groups of, of people. Um, so, for instance, we have uh, country music really drawing on southern white dialects. Uh, you know, sometimes, I, I, I don't know, my, my mom grew up in, in Hampshire County, like out this, in, out this really rural area, so she'll say words like holler and wash tub and things like that. That's part of a that's part of a, a southern dialect or a rural dialect. So, anyways, dialect plays a large role in music. Rap music sort of uh, portrays a lot of urban uh, black dialects, and um, but you know, punk rock it got its dialect from the British working class. So it, it kind of it's kind of cool to know. That leads us to theme two, which is a, brief, a, bit, a bit shorter, a bit briefer. Uh, Basically, theme two is music and identity, and it revolves around the thought that we all learn to be human in particular ways, and music is one of those particular ways that we grow to know ourselves personally, that we grow to become part of this human experience, which I know sounds kind of deep and philosophical, but I promise it's not, it's not all of that, all that tough to grasp on to. So um, when we think about music and identity, I, I want you to think back to the first time you ever listened to a, a popular song it's probably in the radio it was probably in the car on the radio you were probably uh riding along with your parents or grandparents and it was something that you really didn't understand but but you heard quite a bit um you were probably five six seven years old whenever you can first remember this well that kind of those experiences really shape our musical preferences and, th and that kind of leads us into uh early adolescence um where we tend to kind of rebel against those musical preferences that our parents or our grandparents or our, our uh, 
or whoever whoever has we kind of rebel against that we don't want to be the norm we don't want to be the typical person so we we rebel and and try to try to portray ourselves as super unique and then as we grow older we kind of reflect back on that that music and we kind of we kind of find it as ours and and it's something that we really relate to that's why almost everybody you listen to will say that music today just isn't as good as music was in my day that's because they want to be reminded of being young. They want to be reminded of, of simpler times, I guess. So um, trust me, here in about 10 years, uh, music won't be the same as music was in your day. And uh, you'll be saying that to a bunch of, a bunch of uh, high school students your age. So then the, the other part about identity is we have to recognize that there's quite a bit of stereotyping in music. Now, stereotyping has a negative connotation. In, in many senses, it should. But stereotyping really is just a, a convenient way of organizing people into categories. That's what we should, that's, that's the definition of stereotyping. The problem with it is that we tend to do so poorly in some standards. It kind of cuts out anybody that would sort of fit into multiple categories and shoves them into one, and, and that can be sort of offensive at times. For example, um, it, it's really easy to find stereotyping in music uh, throughout basically the entire 20th century, and, and maybe even a bit before that, and it, it continues today. The, uh, For instance, we have the common portrayal of, of women as sexual objects. That's a very, very common uh, stereotype in American popular music. We have an association of men with violence. We have an image of African American men as as playboys or gangsters. We have a characterization a characterization of Southern white men, women, musicians as illiterate backwoods rednecks. And uh, occasionally we associate Jewish musical characteristics with songs about uh, money. And we just have these really sort of sort of offensive stereotypes that uh, come into play with our music, but because they're so common, they, they appear quite frequent. Uh, musicians and, and, and producers sort of play on those quite a bit. So the history of popular music in the United States is replete with examples of minority groups who have reinterpreted derogatory stereotypes, which is kind of meaning that they, they take those stereotypes, make them their own, and uh, make them the basis for distinctive forms of music. For instance, we have uh, James Brown's Say It Loud, uh, I'm Black and I'm Proud. Uh, we have Merle Haggard's Oki from Muskogee. Uh, and then we have Dolly Parton's Dumb Blonde and the Village People's YMCA that kind of play on stereotypes that, uh, that were already given to them, but, but sort of make them a positive thing. So that is it for theme two. Theme three is music and technology. And what we have to recognize here is that from, from the heyday of printed sheet music in the 19th century, through the rise of the, uh, the phonograph record, network radio, and sound film in the 1920s, and right up to the present era of digital recording, uh, computerized sampling, and internet-based radio, technology has really shaped what popular music uh, has become. And it, it, mainly it helps to disseminate popular music to the masses. It helps get it out to the people. So disseminate means to spread, in case, you, in case you weren't aware of that. So what I want you to consider here is how has technology affected our relationship to popular music? Uh, what degree has technology changed over the course of a couple hundred years here how people, how consumers listen to popular music? So some critics of today's musical technology would say that a much higher percentage of Americans were able to perform music for their own enjoyment a century ago when the only way of experiencing music was to hear it performed live or to make it for yourself. So basically, you know, in the early, early 20th century, the only way for us to really listen to music was to either purchase sheet music and play it, or to go somewhere and listen to it performed live. Nowadays, it's, it's at our fingertips literally any second of the day. Um, this decline in music making, uh, personal music making, has been sort of attributed to the mass media and, and technology, and it's said to encourage what we call passive listening. It's something that we've talked about a good bit in this class. Passive listening refers to when we just turn on music or when it's kind of in the background, but we're not really listening to what's happening. Um, passive, miss, passive listening is, is sort of, it, it's, it's great, we all do it, but it, the, the argument is, is that if we continue to passively listen all of the time, music sort of loses its value in, in humanizing us. It, it doesn't really hold the same meaning for us as it once did when the only thing we could do was, was actively listen to it. 
So that's one little argument there with music and technology. The other is analog versus digital recording. So a lot of uh, a lot of current musicians sort of make a point to only use analog recording. Uh, don't think about your mainstream like pop. Like Taylor Swift is definitely using digital recording. Kanye is definitely using digital recording. Uh, uh, Khalid and and uh, and and those guys are definitely using digital recording. But some of your less mainstream but still popular musicians use what's called analog recording, which is is a type of recording that directly mirrors the fluctuation of sound waves. Uh, it's supposed to create a more rich, warm, and authentic sound. So it, it's just kind of kind of something funny to consider there. Then, uh, if any of you are familiar with MTV's Unplugged series, which it might be a little bit a little bit too old for you, but uh, nonetheless, it, it's made a couple of reappearances here and there. Uh, the uh, the MTV Unplugged series is the series in which uh, popular artists come out and perform on only acoustic instruments uh, for the sake of authenticity. And, and artists like R.E.M., Eric Clapton, Nirvana, and even more recently Adele have uh, demonstrated what they consider real musical ability. Uh, I don't really like that term, real musical ability. I think if you're making music, then that's a real musical ability. But uh, that's kind of the basis of MTV's Unplug series. More recently, we have streaming coming into be a huge part of music and technology. Uh, as we have Spotify and Apple Music and, and Pandora really take over how we all listen to music. And then finally, uh, finally we have uh, the last little bit I included here was about Guitar Hero, which, uh, uh, as you guys know, was a video game that came out, between two, uh, came out in 2005 and was really popular uh, until 2010. Um, it, it, sort, of a, sort of an interesting little debate here. Does Guitar Hero is that a is that a true form of musicianship? There, the argument there is is you know Guitar Hero did help non musicians develop their sense of musical form and their rhythmic skills. You had to press all the buttons at the right time, but the game also you know gave the impression that you were really learning how to play guitar. Whenever in truth, if I, I you know I played hours and hours and hours of Guitar Hero and I was you know freaking awesome at Slow Ride. But the fact is that I still couldn't pick up a guitar and play it worth crap. Um, so did it really help me become a better musician? In some instances, yes, but but in some instances, no. So um, that's a, a, another little interesting debate there with how music and technology relate to one another. So this is going to bring us to our first key word of the day. Uh, what I do in these little lectures here, and, and this will happen in, in regular class too, I give you a key word. Um, that will be part of your assignment for the week. Um, so there's always two key words, and you, you write down both of them. I don't include them on the slide, so it, it means that you have to listen to my lovely voice for the entire recording. But the first key word is simply music. So the first key word is music, M-U-S-I-C. This brings us to uh, the final theme here, theme four, uh, which is the music industry. Um, the music industry really is this this massive massive thing particularly in America but but really it's 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 global now so between the 1900s and 1920s sheet music was the principal means of spreading music as i said earlier you purchased sheet music and you could either perform it on your your instrument that you had at home or you went out and listened to it uh, somewhere else but that was that was about it the 1920s, though, saw a big rise in radio, which totally transformed how the music industry operated. Uh, roles like the composer, lyricist, arranger, A&R, which stands for artist and repertoire personnel, producer, sound engineers, publicity personnel, agents, video producers, graphic artists, stagehands, truck drivers, etc., came to be after the rise of the radio. People went on tour, they have to have truck drivers. Uh, people want to sell their t-shirts, they have to have graphic artists. People want to uh, people want to have songs with lyrics, they have to have lyricists. People want to have songs period they have to have a composer people want uh people want somebody to take a song written by a composer on a piano and put it on a uh, guitar and drum set and all this stuff well then you have to have an arranger um so it, there's just so many little moving parts in the music industry and really compared to other industries that that make and disseminate consumer products the music business has always been super unpredictable in the 1890s, uh, you know, 20, a new generation of, of 20 some year old immigrants uh, created these these weird techniques for promoting and, and distributing popular songs. And that's sparked a business that that really has taken over today. 
Um, now we have uh, one out of, it says by the 1980s and 1990s, only about one out of eight records produced made a profit, and a handful of platinum albums certified million sellers uh, were like Michael Jackson's Thriller, Madonna's Like a Virgin, Nirvana's Nevermind, and Dr. Dre's The Chronic um, were kind of shaping that. And, and even now today, thankfully streaming has sort of helped to get not quite as popular artists out there and, and sort of into the mainstream a bit, but we still have we still have artists just completely commanding the uh, the musical the musical environment there. We have people like Taylor Swift that that sort of the sort of when she releases something it, it's very well known very quick. So uh, this brings us to our, our last sort of our last sort of point here. It, are we being overexposed to music? And this is a, a little interesting debate here. It, the argument is is that with such a commonality, music used to be an experience. Music used to be something that you did with people, with friends, or as as a as an evening engagement, or a, it was a a human activity. And music has sort of taken a, a rather uh, ubiquitous or overexposed role that is just super present, every present everywhere we go. We sit down at a restaurant, we're going to be able to listen to. Uh, you know, tons of songs while we're eating our dinner. And whether we're really recognizing it or not, it's it's still there. I would probably just venture to guess that wherever you're sitting right now, if you listen closely enough, within the next at least 15 to 20 minutes, you're probably going to hear some music. Uh, and and the argument, the sort of thought here is, is that overexposure to music diminishing the significance in individual expression? Is, is it becoming less meaningful to us? And, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure. So that's something to think about. So I think that is where we will leave it, guys. So this will this will bring us to our second keyword, uh, and it will complete our phrase. So the second keyword for today's lecture is matters. Um, the second keyword is matters. So put that with the first keyword, and then you have our musical phrase for the day. So first keyword is back a little bit, and the second keyword is matters. All right, well, I hope you guys enjoyed it, and please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll be looking for you.